Huntsman Cancer Institute. Happy to be here. Uh, and first off, we'll um, have a talk uh, by Dr. Haifeng Young. He is uh, an assistant professor at Thomas Jefferson University, and he'll be telling us about analyzing therapeutic impact of di-ABZI on PBRM1 deficient clear cell kidney cancer tumors. Thank you. OK. So, uh, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, so how a sting diazi is a sting agonist. So we want to you know in investigate uh, how it might impact on uh, the treatment of kidney cancer. So next slide, please. So uh, I think this crowd uh, doesn't need too much of introduction, but uh, then well through through the uh, genomic study, it is well known that. Okay, the format. Is there a way to point? Okay. No, okay. Yeah, sure. So, right. So, uh, in kidney cancer, the uh, initiating event is primarily the uh, mutation of a critical gene called Bonhipalinda, the VHL gene. And then after that, they, they will be combined with uh, the secondary mutation, such as uh, PBR1, BAP1, CD2. P10, kdm 5 c so on and so forth. And it is known that you know, they, all those secondary tumor suppressors gave the, uh, dif uh, fl different flavors to different kind of uh, CCRCC tumors. But then uh, my lab actually pondered one question, is it possible that the secondary mutation actually uh, collaborate with the primary loss of VHL and that caught, uh, the drove the, the uh, tumor genesis? So my lab actually, in a couple of years back, we did find something that VHL, uh, HIF2 alpha, which is a, a primary uh, driver for, uh, the oncogenic driver for CCRCC, and then also pbr one cd 2 kdm 5 c BAP1, they all converge on one pathway, which is nominally uh, the type 1 uh, interferon pathway. And, and so, uh, yeah. So a uh, talented uh, graduate student, Lauren Lamba in my lab, decided to ask, okay, well, how does VHL uh, molecularly uh, impact on um, uh, ISGF3, which is a, a target of the type 1 interferon pathway? Uh, it's a transferring transferring factor. And so she looked at the VHL plus or minus uh, CCRC cells, uh, the pairs, and then found out whenever you put the VHL back in there, the ISGF3 uh, 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 readouts, uh, the targets, they all went down. So she went even further to say, okay, well, type 1 interferon pathways are known to be induced by interferon alpha and interferon beta. Uh, does VHL play any role in their transcription level? And she found out that indeed uh, the presence of VHL always suppresses the expression of interferon beta, but not interferon alpha. In, in those cancer cells, obviously we did this in multiple system, and then it's always consistent. And furthermore, she showed that uh, this is HIF-2 alpha dependent. Basically, in the VHL defective cells where HIF-2 alpha is considered active, you suppress the expression HIF-2 alpha, interferon beta will also go down. And then also, yes, interferon beta was shown to be responsible for the upregulation of ISGF3 in the VHL defective cells. And then we asked, okay, well, what about PBM1? Uh, does it regulate ISGF3 uh, activity? And so here, with the uh, examination of individual target of, uh, of ISGF3, like OS1, I544L, we saw that pb one is required for that in human uh, cancer cells. And uh, from my collaborator's lab, uh, Billy Kim at UNC Chapel Hill, it, they have a PBM1 conditional knockout mice. So they acutely knock out PBM1 in the kidneys, uh, cortex uh, of, of those mice, and then compare that with the control. And you can see here the uh, ISGF3 target uh, also went down after PBM1 was specifically and acutely uh, knocked out in mouse uh, kidneys. So PBM1 is it indeed required to maintain the ISGF3 activity, right? So um, and so ISGF3 is a basically something that's induced by HIF-12. So how does that impact on, say, tumor growth? 
right? We know that HIF-12 is a very potent driver of tumor genesis in multiple systems. Uh, is ISGFD a uh, oncogenic force or actually a tumor suppressive force? <clears throat> so to address that, we suppress the expression of uh, one subunit of ISGF3, IRF9, <clears throat> and we saw that uh, uh, in the xenograph model, uh, whenever you knock down uh, uh, IRF9, the tumor got much bigger instead of smaller, even though <clears throat> it, it is a HIF uh, suppressor, uh, uh, a HIF uh, target. And we found out this is actually true in all the uh, subunits that we tested. Uh, the, uh, STAT2, uh, you knock down STAT2, which is a part of ISGF3, the same thing. Knock down another subunit, the same thing. And also, even in interferon beta, remember, hif 12 induced induced uh, interferon beta. When we knock down uh, interferon beta, also the tumor got significantly bigger. So uh, all the evidence uh, points to the direction that ISGF3 is actually a tumor suppressor, which is induced by uh, hif 12 So uh, after knowing that, then we asked, okay, well, can you, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of this to see whether uh, ISGF3 activation can be tumor suppressive. We tried two, two systems. One is actually in a cell line that we got from uh, Brian Rini from Cleveland Clinic that is in the renal 2 with a bad point knockdown. The tumor got bigger, and then we introduced uh, subunits of ISGF3 to artificially jack up the activity of ISGF3, and you can see here uh, that basically obliterated the uh, the 92C obliterated the, uh, the, the tumor formation uh, in, in, in those mice. And in another model, when, in the 7886 cells, we knocked on PBN1, we know they're much bigger, the tumor group way bigger, and then we re-expressed the uh, uh, ISGF3 uh, subunit as well, and as you can see here, STAT2 plus IRF9 also very potently suppressed the tumor growth in, in those tumors. So that's very good, but then those are genetic activation of IGF-3. So we want to, uh, you know, you just can't do that, in, you know, in, in human. So what about a systematic drug that can activate IGF-3? So uh, GSK identified a compound called diabzi that can do just that. It's a sting agonist. So we decided to treat uh, the uh, uh, Xenograph model with either wild type uh, you know, PBN1 or PBN knockdown in three different systems 70 cell, RENA2, or UMRC2, uh, three different systems. And then we treat them with just vehicle or diapsy that uh, activated. And then using various methods, we, you know, uh, we confirmed that the system, systematic activation of ISGF did happen in those tumor. And you can see here with the, with the tally, uh, it's very interesting that in the PBL1 uh, knockdown the tumor, uh, if it's treated with vehicle, then you know, the necrosis is mostly uh, very low, that's zero or 15%. But after they were treated with diapsy, the necrosis number jumped, okay? And then you can see here, this jump was actually unique to the tumor with PBL1 knockdown, suggesting the PBL1 knockdown tumor with three different systems that they are significantly more sensitive to the sting agonist, to the ISGF3 activation. Another interesting thing that we noticed is that we use a CD45 to check the, uh, the which is a kind of pan immune cells uh, marker to check for the presence of the immune cells in the tumor. Uh, so consistent with what Dr. Eric Yonish has found that when you lose PBR1, the, 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 the tumor becomes some, some kind of a, a, a uh, immune cell desert. We found the same thing in our system as well. But then after sting agonist treatment in all three, three systems, the CD45 uh, 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 the immune cell infiltration was very evident. So, uh, and in another system when we have the BAP1 knockdown, that, uh, and then we treated with sting agonist, we actually saw the, uh, the sting uh, diapsy was uh, uh, very effective in suppressing tumor growth. So, what we think right now is, is like this. After VHL is lost, which is in the primary step, HIF is activated. And HIF is a very potent oncogenic force because it induces VGF, TGL5, and PDGF, so on and so forth. That drives the tumor growth. But at the same time, through a mechanism uh, that is not completely clear just yet, through HIF, it activates in ISGF type 1 interferon, beta, and then ISGF3. And we think this is kind of a tumor surveillance mechanism that the tumor just don't like. 
And then in order to basically get around that, it found multiple ways to, you know, to inactivate uh, the secondary uh, tumor suppressor genes to actually dampen this uh, tumor suppressor pathway through PBN1, BAP1, KDM5 C or CD2. But then the good thing about that is that those secondary mutations, they dampen the ISGF3, but they don't kill it. The, the seed is still there. We can, we can blow at it and then just you know, make the flame go, go stronger. And then we think that sting agonist being, uh, can be a very potent way to activate ISGF3 and then basically you know, re-engage the brick and slam on it and then use that to block tumor growth. And then, you know, interestingly, the, the PBN1 results show that maybe that one with the, the secondary mutation, if uh, in, in, in uh, that sort of uh, dampen the ISGF3, they could be addicted to the loss of the ISGF3, that if you restore that, they become uh, exquisitely sensitive to the re-engagement of the break. So that's uh, what we have so far. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank all the people who how to uh, make the, uh, all those research possible and also uh, the funding agency, uh, especially the DOD KCRP here. Thank you. So then the questions will come. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Yang. And um, we also have joining us um, Dr. Uh, Guang Peng. Um, she is an associate professor at MD Anderson uh, Cancer Institute. Um, and um, happy to have her speaking to, with us today about her research. So thank you all. And thank for the organizer for the opportunity to present our recent work uh, about DNA damage response and DNA repair in the kidney cancer. Yeah. A second. One slides second. are coming. Yeah, slides are. Take the moment to say we'll we'll take questions after the second talk. Perfect. Uh, so the title of my talk is about the targeting the DNA damage repair network to promote an innate immune response in CCRCC. So this is a collaborative work between my lab and also Dr. Eric Yonash lab in Amgenes Cancer Center. So uh, I'm a basic research scientist. My research is focused on the DNA damage response and the DNA repair network. As we know, our genome is constantly challenged by the environment DNA damage factors, such as UV, radiation, and also endogenous DNA damage factors, such as metabolism stress, and also the replication stress. So any dysfunction of the DNA damage response and the repair network on the one hand, it will lead to the genomic rearrangement and lead to the mutation load uh, increase. That will help to generate a new antigen. That is the initial step to activate adaptive immune response. On the other hand, the DNA damage cannot be resolved successfully. It will generate a cytosolic DNA, kind of get out from our genome to the cytosol. This DNA fragment can be recognized by the DNA sensing pathway those pathways are usually used by our cells to defense virus DNA, bacterial DNA, but a similar mechanism can be also utilized to recognize our own genome small fragment kind of peeled off from our genome. Thus, we initiate innate immune response. So basically, adaptive and immune, innate immune response work together to promote anti-tumor immunity. Anti-tumor immunity has been a central focus now for the cancer immunoprevention and the immunotherapy. In collaboration with Eric, we ask a question, is DNA damage response and the repair pathway altered in CCRCC tumors? So first, previous studies have been shown the VHL loss can lead to the replication stress. So what is replication stress? It's an increased DNA replication associated damage. And secondly, we analyzed the cohort of CCRCC tumors in Eric's lab uh, at a different stage of the CCRCC development. Interestingly, there's one unique DNA repair pathway called homologous recombination DNA repair that is high fidelity DNA repair is altered in the CCRCC. And um, most strikingly, during the uh, stage progression, we see the defective HR repair is enriched in the early stage CCRCC tumors and it's associated with a better prognosis in CCRCC patient. 
as we know, VHL is required for the kidney cancer development, but it's not sufficient to promote cancer development. So the first key question in our research we want to address is can we identify molecular determinants counteracting replicant dress induced DNA damage response to promote the survival of VHL deficient cancer cells and thus to initiate and promote CCRCC tumor driven by the VHL because we know VHL deficiency is not sufficient. There are other genetic events going to help the VHL. And just like what we observed from the clinical, kidney cancer patient is just like our preclinical mouse model tumor. Kidney tumors exhibit sensitivity to the immunotherapy, such as PBM1 loss tumor, also showed a certain degree of sensitivity to the immunotherapy, but the response is very heterogeneous. It's a key question to identify the patient who has immunotherapy sensitive tumor and also help the patient with insensitive tumor. As we know, in the clinical, tumor burden and the mismatch of deficiency has been used as an FDA approved biomarker, pan cancer marker, to stratify patients for immunotherapy. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, since our CC tumors are not cancer type with high mutation load compared to the melanoma, lung cancer, or maybe colon cancer, as I circled in the red circle, it's right in the middle. So if mutation burden or mismatch repair deficiency is not sufficient for the CSR tumors to identify the uh, therapeutic response efficacy, what we can do? So the next key question in our research will ask is, can we modulate DNA damage dependent innate immune signaling to enhance the efficacy of immunotherapy in CCRCC tumors by targeting the DDR and the DNA repair network? So to address these two questions, we focus our research on the S phase DNA damage response. DDR is a DNA damage response. So why is S phase? As you can see from this simplified cartoon, S phase DDR network connect important phosphorylation signaling from multiple kinases at a different cell cycle stage to control the DNA replication stability. Because the DNA replication phase, the S phase, is the most precious time for our genome and almost uh, the vulnerable time to generate endogenous damage. So such as the ATM, check two are the kinase in the G1 phase, ATR and the check one are the kinase work on the S phase, and the V1 is primarily in the G2M phase. So to identify the genetic requirement for the S phase DDR, we took two approaches. The first approach is the candidate gene approach. You use this gene because we know there's a handful of very important tumor suppressors involved in the CCRCC tumor development. One of them is PBM1. So we use the candidate gene approach. One interesting finding we found about this PBM1 is PBM1 is a chromatin remodeling complex. It controls the chromatin accessibility for the proteins get to the DNA damage site and required for the ATR signaling activation. And the second approach, we use unbiased genetic approach. We conduct a genome-wide siRNA screening to identify SDDR regulators. As I showed in the red letter, that's one gene jumped off as our candidate, top candidate is called NPRL2. So this NPRL2 has identified from a screening a new regulator of s phase DDR. More interestingly, when we did the TCGA analysis, among the 32 cancer types, the alteration of NPR2 is most significantly in the CCRCC tumors. As you can see, almost 10% of CCRCC tumors involve this deletion of NPR2 genetic loci. So what is the clinical relevance of NPR2? As you can see, we stratified the patient by the high and the low NPR2 expression. Patient, kidney cancer patient with low NPR2 showed a better prognosis. And secondly, those patients with low NPR2 tumors has increased tumor infiltrated lymphocytes. Consistent with this result, we do see the patient with low NPR2 expression has shown a better response to the immunocheckpoint uh, blockade treatment in multiple cohorts. So this data suggests that perhaps NPR2 deficiency or maybe more general as phase DDR deficiency will 
become an alternative stratification marker for the kidney cancer patient to identify who has a sensitive immunotherapy. So based on our research, we propose the following model for our uh, modulation DNA damage dependent innate immune signaling. So first of all, WHL as the such important genetic events in the CCRCC is leading to the replication of associated DNA damage. On one genetic axial, loss of PM1 in about 30% of patients, it leads to the permissive chromatin status and lead to the counteracting mechanism to help the cells defense the damage through the ATR activation. So because of this mechanism, we propose ATR inhibitor could be a selective choice for the tumors without PBM1. On the other hand, NPL2 loss is mutually exclusive with the PBM1. It happened in 10% of CCRCC tumors. In this patient, they go through different mechanisms to counteract VHL induced replicant dress. It's primarily through the protein stability control of a DNA damage checkpoint. So our study indicate the G2M check kinase V1 could be important target. So both ATR inhibitor, check one inhibitor, um, V1 inhibitor has been tested in clinical studies. So use these two different DDR inhibitors targeted to different genetic background in the CCRCC tumors. We hope it will cause a common molecular mechanism uh, consequence that is so cause the unresolved DNA damage that will activate CGS-16 DNA damage sensor pathway and uh, lead to the activation of type 1 interferon gamma response and then it will help us to enhance anti-tumor immunity. So in future, of course, we'll continue our mechanism study to identify how we induce cancer cell intrinsic innate immune signaling, primarily through targeting altered DNA damage response repair pathway. Secondly, we would like to utilize the cancer patient sample and also biomedical approach to molecular characterize the CCRCC tumors of this DNA damage dependent innate immune signaling pathway. And finally, use the preclinical animal models, we hope to test the therapeutic effects of using the DDR inhibitor in the CCR CC tumors based on the specific genetic context. So it is truly our hope that our research can generate very important preclinical data to help the design of a clinical trial because the successful clinical trial really depends on how we select the patients, what drug we should choose, and how we use the drug, for example, the dosage, the uh, treatment schedule, the sequence, and how we're going to combine this drug with the immunotherapy. Um, finally, uh, I wanted to thank my, uh, the people working in my lab and also uh, in my collaborator's lab, Dr. Yonash lab, and also our collaborators inside and outside our institution, including pathologists, bioinformatician, and our immunologists. And finally, I want to thank our advocates who work with us on our project, provide us insights, feedback, and also inspiration. And finally, I want to thank the uh, DOD Translational Research Partnership Award, because this award has really helped us to bring our research step forward to connect our DNA damage response repair work to the kidney cancer research. And uh, thank you, the organizer, to bring the village or maybe the whole society together for the cancer research. Thank you. So do you have questions? <coughs> we do have a few minutes for questions from the audience, and I see uh, Dr. Hensky. Um, that's super interesting. NPRL2 is a component of the Gator 1 complex that, oh, sorry, uh, NPRL2 is a component of the Gator 1 complex that regulates mTOR. So, how do you know for sure that what you're seeing is DNA damage dependent and not mTOR dependent? Yes, yes. Thank you for your great question. Actually, this is the question raised by the review, and our paper got rejected by the NCB after revision. Exactly the same reason. I hope you are not the reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> because mTOR is a such an important complex, it can touch everywhere for the cancer biology. We do have the evidence when we knock down mTOR uh, central components, because NPL2 control the mTOR activation on the lysosome. So we do uh, have the mTOR pathway knockdown and also activation like a TSC2 knockout model to demonstrate it. If we change the mTOR signaling, 
per se, it's not a form the same phenotype at the NPL2 knockdown. But of course, the key question is the NPL2 will propose with the innate immune response. Maybe mTOR still control the innate immune response, not through the upstream. So the only thing I can exclude is mTOR signaling per se does not change the cell cycle DNA damage checkpoint, but still can be related to the innate immune. So thank you for your question. Joe, Joe has. Oh, Dr. Lee. Uh, just, so we want inhibitors have previously been identified in synthetic lethality screens for uh, CD2 mutations. I was wondering from a pathway conversion sort of standpoint, where does uh, NRL2 um, and CD2, they relate in some sort of way? Um, so you mean the NPL2 in the CD2 context? Well, so I'm just curious in terms of uh, given that your model proposes using we one inhibition, mm -hmm. uh, and we've also seen in other studies that for patients with CET-D2 mutations, uh, there is synthetic lethality with also inhibition of we one mm -hmm. uh, whether or not there's some sort of convergence of the pathways or whether or not uh, NRL2 is somewhere within uh, the CET-D2 pathogenesis so pathway. NPL2 actually is localized in the 3P genomic region. That is why deletion is so deep in the kidney cancer. And so it's kind of the parallel pathway in my uh, understanding. We have CD2, we have uh, BAP1, we have the uh, PBM1, and maybe NPL2. So it could be parallel, not really connected. But uh, as just uh, the question mentioned, there are a lot of genes involved in the DDR and the DNA repair has been reported in the CCR tumor. I only showed the two little evidence on my slides, but the CD2 has been reported control the repair pathway. So it's very likely it caused the sensitivity to the V1 inhibitor as well. Yeah. I also saw Dr. Malaport. So that was a great talk. So something I have trouble with your talk because VHL regulates the cell cycle. Um, whether it's the um, G2M, any poor part of this, um, targeting CDK4-6, we want all of these will have a detrimental effect in CCRCC that they have VHL mutation. So my question is, how do you, how do you reconcile this? How do you dissect this? Um, and just concentrating on the DNA damage. Um, same for we want targeting we want it has been shown before. Same as the um, uh, G2M uh, causes aneuploidy. There is a clear evidence of VHL regulating that. So targeting any of these checkpoint. Uh, cell cycle checkpoints will have a detrimental effects without getting the uh, immunotherapy or any of these other things involved. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, I only have seven minutes. If I have seven zero minutes, I can discuss more. So I, I won't uh, you just can, keep You can my... fit in four elephants in a, in a Volkswagen. Yes, you sure. Can. I, will, I will try. So as you mentioned, the VHL itself has a very strong driving to the cell cycle. That's already established. That's a part of the reason why VHL loss causes replication stress, because the proliferation is out of control. So now we are more interested in the DDR targeting as uh, the, the speaker just mentioned, the V1 inhibitor in the clinical trial showed uh, a lot of toxicity because you, the sufficient dosage to have this anti-cancer effect already kill a lot of normal cells like hemopoietic cells. So now in our research, because this immune response becomes so important and we understand a bit more, so we try to kind of use the DDR inhibitor such as ATR or CHEC1 or V1 originally a little bit toxic as an immune modulation based on already pre-existing DDR defect in the CCR tumors. So that's with the hope we can reduce the toxicity and achieve the specificity to target tumor cells, especially on top of the immunotherapy kind of have synergy. So that's the idea. Yeah. I agree. What an engaging conversation <laughs> uh, from, uh, and the fascinating talks. So we'll have to move on to the next step. So next talk is actually by Dr. Freeman, uh, who is uh, uh, doing it for Dr. Mahoney. Uh, so, Dr. Okay. Freeman. I'd like to, um, I'm presenting Kathleen Mahoney's uh, talk. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for this opportunity to still present it. Um, okay, 
I wanted to describe a new immunological pathway that we've become enthusiastic about for its relevance in kidney cancer. Um, these are Kathleen's disclosures and my own disclosures. So the B7 family of molecules includes PDL1, PDL2, CD80, 86, which have been very important in the regulation of the immune response and are primary immune checkpoints. There's another member of the family called HHLA2. And we looked uh, with Sam Freeman at all the B7 family members that were expressed in kidney cancer. And kidney cancer is really remarkable because it's very heavily immunologically um, infiltrated. But what was remarkable was that of all the members of this gene family, the one most highly expressed in kidney cancer um, as opposed to normal kidney cells was HHLA2. Um, the other thing that was remarkable about um, HHLA2 is with Sabina Signoretti, we did immunohistochemistry of PDL1 expression and HHLA2 expression. And what was remarkable was how different they were. They were non redundant. If they were both expressed in the same tumor cell, what you'd see is lots of uh, dots up in the upper right. But what you see is the PDL1s are the red dots on the left, and you can have a range of expression, or you can have the HHLA2 expression, which are the black dots on the bottom. But what you don't see is tumor cells expressing both. And in the rare tumors, um, which turns out to express both of them, um, what you see is that they're in, in different areas. So on the right here, you see the PDL1 expression in this is in the upper right section of this tumor, but the HHLA expression is down here in the lower left. So they're really different. And we did a screen of all the cell surface molecules for what bound to HHLA2. And we identified a molecule called kir 3 dl 3 which is a member of the killer inhibitory receptors. And this is a family of about 15 genes. And we took the members, all the 15 members of this gene and individually asked which ones did HHLA2 bind to. And the black dot shows that HHLA2 only bound to this one member of the family, kir 3 dl 3 and it also has another known receptor, TMIGD2, and it binds about equally well to both of these receptors. Now, these two receptors have different functions. Um, the TMIGD2 has been shown by the Zhang and Chen lab to have a, an immunostimulatory effect, but this is only expressed on naive cells and is lost on activated cells, so it only works early. In contrast, the kir 3 dl 3 is expressed after T cell activation. So it's on a modest proportion of activated T cells and a good proportion of natural killer cells. And there it inhibits these cells. It'll, it will inhibit their cytolysis, proliferation, and cytokine production. And this was published in two papers. Um, by uh, my lab and Rupal Bhatt and Kathleen, and also by Zing Zing Zhang's lab. Now, there are challenges for developing this pathway. Um, the cure th all three members of this pathway, uh, HHLA2, CARE 3 and TMIGT2, are not expressed in rodents. And indeed, there are about 50 genes which are in uh, primates and humans, but not in rodents. So we can't look at a direct rodent model to analyze this pathway. Um, we have to rely on developing humanized mouse models to test the therapeutics and resistance mechanisms. And the biology of HHLA2 and carcinomas such as RCC, it may be diff very different from sarcoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and what's remarkable about HHLA2 is it's very much an in vivo molecule. So if we take kidney cancer cells and right out of the tumor, 
they express HHLA2. And you can see this on the right, ex vivo out of, out of uh, the surgical sample. There's lots of HHLA2 expression on the tumor cells. But over the course of four weeks, this expression is lost. So the, there's some in vivo signal which is maintaining expression, which isn't replicated uh, in vitro. And um, if you take uh, RCC tumor cell lines, in vitro, they're negative. So A498, 7860 don't express HHLA2 in vitro. But if you put them in a mouse, these negative lines become positive and HHLA2 is re-expressed. So there's an in vivo signal for expression. It's not hypoxia. We've looked at a number of signals, um, and it's not any of the common cytokines that regulate um, immunological molecules. Um, we've tested a number. This is three of them, interferon gamma, IL-10, and TGF-beta. Uh, interferon is a great upregulator of PDL1, but it doesn't upregulate HHLA2. So we're now in our future directions looking to understand the pathways that regulate HHLA2 expression, because we'll help this, we think this will help us develop combinatorial therapies or select patient populations. And we're do, doing this by a whole genome CRISPR screen. And we also wanted to develop testable human humanized mouse models to identify the best therapy, therapeutic agents, and the optimal patient population to treat. And we're really asking, is this pathway more effective in tumors that are sensitive to CD8 or particularly to NK cell killing? Um, we really are enthusiastic about this pathway because we think it's non-redundant with PD-1. It's very differently regulated. Um, we also are looking to analyze HHLA2 expression on patient samples of post PD-1 and TKI therapy um, with some interesting, intriguing early results. And we want to optimally develop the immunohistochemistry as a potential companion biomarker. And we think with Sabina's lab, we now have this optimized. And then we wanted to determine what's the optimal patient uh, population to treat. Um, in terms of uh, acknowledgments, this has really been a great collaboration with Kathleen's lab and my lab and Rupal Bots. Um, we've had great clinical connections with David McDermott, um, Rupal Bot, uh, Tony Chueri, um, and wonderful immunohistochemistry with Sabina. Um, and we're also really interested in developing this. So we've partnered with uh, Next Point Therapeutics uh, to really make agents and bring it to kidney cancer patients. Thank you. So do the questions and answers after second talk. So we'll do the, take the questions after this. So second uh, talk is by Dr. Wayne Morosco. And uh, he will give a talk on novel cellular therapies Push the green to button. achieve cures in clear cell RCC. Uh, hi, everyone. I'd like, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to talk about the novel <laughs> okay, reboot. So you heard a little bit from um, Suzanne this morning about CAR T cell therapy, and I just want to, as a general sort of introduction, um, CAR T cells are living drugs. Uh, they are uh, developed by taking white blood cells out of an individual by apheresis, genetically engineering them in tissue culture to, um, to express what we call a CAR moiety, which is a form of a T cell receptor. 
uh, that has directed killing towards tumor cells. They are expanded in culture, reinfused back into the patient, and when it all works well, they have potent tumor activity. These have been quite successful for the treatment of hematologic malignancies. There are six FDA-approved drugs for multiple myeloma and, and forms of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. However, they've had problems with um, their use and development in solid tumors because of what we now know is the tumor microenvironment, which is quite different. So we've developed a strategy, it's been going on for quite some time now, to develop what we call defer cars, which are um, dual-targeted, fine-tuned, immune-restoring uh, immune CAR T-cells. And they're based on three principles. One, dual-targeting to improve efficacy, because we know solid tumors have tumor cell heterogeneity. You just saw it from Gordon's talk. Um, but it's well known that this is a major um, finding in solid tumors. Second of all, improving safety. Unfortunately, the molecules that are overexpressed on tumor cells are often expressed on normal healthy cells, so it's a matter of overexpression. If you don't have selectivity to killing your tumor cells, you will have adverse side effects to normal tissues. So we have to fine tune the affinity of these targeting moieties to target high overexpression tumors, but not normal level of expression of those markers on healthy cells. And lastly, really the holy grail, which is immune restoring, the ability to reverse the, the local tumor microenvironment, to change it to become pro-tumor. Uh, and as you know, this, these microenvironments, tumor microenvironments have commandeered uh, the immune cells that have gotten there, they become exhausted, they hang out there, they can't do anything, and that's one of the major uh, basis of the therapies of checkpoint control inhibitors. So we have the ability to deliver antibodies to the tumor site and change it locally. So um, this cartoon has three panels on it. The top is the design of our therapies. It contains two antibodies in tandem called SCFE1 and SCFE2. This is a generic uh, cartoon of what a car looks like. The only difference here is at the very three, the right side of that, you see IR payloads, and this is where we put different antibodies in there to change the tumor microenvironment once the CAR T cells migrate to the tumor. On the, we decided to do this against two markers that are commonly overexpressed in renal cell carcinoma. Uh, one is CA9, and the other is CD70. CA9 was kind of the molecule du jour when I started this work in 2004. Uh, you can see by the distribution of those that CA9 is expressed on most renal cell carcinoma cells. You can see in the next column, CD70, it is, there's two CAR T cell therapies in clinical trials right now, corporate sponsored that use CD70 as a marker. But as you can see by that, not all tumors express CD70. And then the last two columns on the left are what the combinations look like at together. The right shows an example of tumor cell heterogeneity. If you look at patient 4770503, oh, you see that there's overlay of brown and um, brown, which is CD70, and pink, which is CA9. But on the patient on the right, on patient 477486, you see there are islands of brown cells and islands of pink cells. So there's heterogeneity in the expression within a solid tumor. Uh, and this is what I was referring to by um, when I mentioned uh, efficacy. So safety is now a matter of overcoming that problem of common expression of markers on tumor cells that are also expressed on healthy cells. So we have to increase the therapeutic index to only target high expressing cells, but not low expressing cells of a given target. That's called a therapeutic index, and that's shown in the cartoon on the left right. The problem with kidney cancer is that CA9, which is the most important of the targets, is also expressed on the epithelium or the, the um, bile duct epithelium, as you can see in the bottom left panel on that right bottom corner, where you see cytoplasmic staining of CA9 in cholangiocytes. It's not on the surface, it's in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. If you look at the top right, this is how we have now engineered the molecule to be safe for normal cells. The left set of bars there is showing 15 different CAR moieties directed to CA9. You can see they all kill cancer cells at the um, renal cell carcinoma cells at the same level. 
If you look at the right upper panel, you'll see there's a gradation. Uh, and the one that's highlighted in the red box is a low affinity, high avidity car that does not kill cholangiocytes. So by dialing down the affinity to maintain high avidity but low affinity, we are now able to selectively kill tumor cells and not harm healthy cells. The second target on the bottom right is a CD70, which is less of a problem. The side effect is only on white blood cells, but this demonstration shows that we can effectively target that without killing white blood cells as well. Um, this is a panel of our in vivo studies in mice. I'll just concentrate on the immunohistochemistry in the middle. You can see granzyme B on the right and PDL1 on the left. So this is killing of a PDL1 positive tumor in a, in a mouse model. And you can see in the right side, those brown stainings on the bottom of those bottom two panels are in CAR T cells that are expressing an anti pdl one You're restoring anti-tumor killing activity as composed of the middle panel, which is the CAR T cell without a payload, without pdl one If you look at the right bottom, that's evidence of exhaustion markers. When you secrete antibodies locally, you decrease exhaustion of the CAR T cells so they function uh, more profoundly and longer. They don't get actually exhausted. And um, the other two panels are tumor weight and anti-tumor effect, again, showing that the green and um, blue bars are the uh, CAR T cells that are secreting the antibodies locally at the tumor site. Now, um, I'm scientific director of Harvard Medical School's Humanized Mouse Corps. We've created thousands of humanized mice over the years, and we have now adapted this to um, the treatment of renal cell carcinoma. Actually, the left upper cartoon just shows that we take um, hematopoietic stem cells, we inject them into newborn mice. After about four months, they're humanized and express human uh, peripheral blood, uh, human lymphocytes. And then we inject um, these mice that are humanized now with these different CAR T cell vectors. The left bottom panel shows the superiority in the red line of a CAR T cell expressing PDL1. The middle orange shows the CAR T cell not expressing PDL1 with an irrelevant antibody, and the blue shows an irrelevant CAR T cell expressing anti PDL1. So, systemic therapy does not give us the same outcome as does local therapy. The tumor weight is shown in the middle, the, the, hemo, the, the um, imaging is shown on the right. And basically, in all studies we've done, uh, the superiority has been shown by locally secreting checkpoint blockade inhibitors at the tumor site, which changes and reverses and prevents T cell exhaustion. Now, um, what we've done in this humanized mouse model is we've done the kind of sophisticated work that you've now seen in the most recent papers using uh, single cell RNA-seq and transtrichomics to be able to follow the actual cells that are getting into the tumor. So the, um, if you look at the middle, uh, the middle upper panels there on the left, that's an overlay of renal cell carcinoma patient white blood cells with the white blood cells we uh, obtained from the tumors of the mice. And in the, uh, the right upper middle there, where you've got the red boxes, that shows that we're actually able to reproduce the tumor infiltrate in the humanized mouse model, um, similar to those in the RCC patients. And in the left bottom, that shows the infiltrate. While we don't see much difference in the T cell infiltrate, we do see a big difference in exhaustion, of, as I've shown you. But the middle panel shows in the pd one secreting CAR T cell, we have an increase in B cells. And on the right panel there, it shows a decrease in myeloid cells. So the PDL1 addition actually causes an increase in B cell infiltration and a decrease in myeloid cell infiltration. And the right upper end, if you look at cytotoxicity, exhaustion, and uh, terminal exhaustion, the anti PDL1 secreting CAR T cells have the highest cytotoxicity the lowest exhaustion and the lowest terminal exhaustion compared to the other control groups. And I think what's most importantly about these sort of more sophisticated studies is the right upper panel, which is crosstalk between the immune cell subsets in the tumor. And what you can see here is that there is um, the development of crosstalk between follicular helper T cells and B cells, which are responsible, as some of you may know, with the recent findings in the field of renal cell carcinoma of the presence of tertiary lymphoid structures 
that are positively uh, associated with prognosis in response to checkpoint blockade inhibitor. And in the very bottom, in the blue um, um, rows going across, there's a decrease in um, M2 T cell communications. So in the work that a number of investigators in this room have published of the importance of crosstalk between M2 macrophages and cytotoxic T cells, that is inhibited in this model. And there's an increase in follicular helper T cell and B cell communication in this model. We think the model itself is very valuable to, to, to uh, evaluate uh, immune therapies in um, uh, moving forward. And in the last data slide, I mean, I've been working on this for a long time now. Um, we're finally uh, doing the last, hopefully, the last experiment before we present our IND package to the FDA. This is going to be, uh, our plan is, to have a dual-targeted anti-CA9 CD70 CAR T cell secreting anti-PD1 CTLA4 bispecific antibody for the treatment of advanced renal cell carcinoma. Why that combination? Well, I think you are all familiar with the results of the Checkmate uh, 214 studies that show an increase in um, pro pro um, progression-free survival uh, in patients who were treated with combination checkpoint blockade inhibitors. And most importantly, um, in the right upper panel, the bispecific antibody is actually more uh, potent than any of the antibodies used in combination. And lastly, the safety control. Uh, we have, I've told you, we engineered the anti-CA9 CAR T to not um, kill cholangiocytes. This is a HISH and immunohistochemistry staining to show that we're now able to do that without killing or destruction of the, uh, the um, bile duct epithelial cholangiocytes. So in summary, you know, this is combination cellular immunotherapy. I only bring up the market size because I'm really trying to get big pharma interested in this. I mean, I'll go the hard way and get it done myself, but certainly it'd be nice to get some serious money um, behind it, um, that kind of money. The payloads can be determined uh, pre, uh, in advance in um, humanized mouse models. Uh, the, this is cost of combination therapy um, as a single agent. You don't have to pay extra for it because you're getting the monoclonal antibodies free. And then lastly, I think this will be you know, good for payers because they don't have to keep shelling out additional funds. So I'd like to thank many collaborators. Uh, many of them are in this room, but a very dedicated lab, uh, Yufei Wang, who's just really a star, has a pioneer of this work. And, um, and of course, uh, I, I just want to tell you, that um, the DOD KCRP uh, awards have been central to all this. So, um, you know, this is really drug development um, that these awards have funded. So I'd like to thank you. Fantastic Questions. summaries yeah. uh, and, and talks. I think we have a few more minutes. Maybe I can start off. Um, Dr. Freeman, I'm really curious. Um, you've described to us these interplays between tumor and the immune system and the microenvironment. And um, from a clinical aspect, we all think a lot about the IMDC inflammatory uh, phenotype. How do you cross that with the HLHLA expression and the CURD3L3 um, um, uh, pathway? Uh. I don't have any great insights on there yet. I, I, I mean, I, I'd love to see yeah. some associations and yeah. um, I, I think we need think to through. we need to yeah. do those. Yeah. Um, just one comment I might make that that is a particularly good choice of Wayne's for the antibody to include in his in his, in his CAR T is the CTLA four PD one bi specific because it has a different mechanism of action as reported by an AstraZeneca talk yesterday. It's CTLA-4 is a molecule that comes to the cell surface and then goes back in, so it cycles. But, and it turns out that the bispecific will come when it grabs both a PD-1 and a CTLA-4, will drag the PD-1 off the cell surface into the cell so it really takes it out of circulation. So um, I think that's a particularly attractive strategy. There's a couple of papers published now and other work that I've seen that's not published. The, um, it's a very special combination. 
uh, as Gordon said, it's, um, it does some remarkable things, but its efficacy in, in animal studies has been quite profound, actually. So I think, um, you know, it's late to the game here for this because of all these other new checkpoint blockade inhibitors that are coming forth. But I think this particular combination is quite potent. And I, and I want to just say that you can't, um, um, Drew mentioned it this morning in his, in the, in the fireside chat, that, you know, these molecules tend to like to work within a few cell distances of one another. So we're getting that secreted right at the site of action. So it's not going systemically. If you look systemically, you don't actually see it. They're really staying locally. We have immunohistochemistry to show that. So you can really get very high concentrations constitutively at the tumor site. And uh, then they have other biological properties. So the idea is you know, pretty good. Um, and the other reason that we chose it is, you know, we have to get in front of the FDA here. And the FDA is going to want to know the biological activity of every component of your system. So you just can't say, yeah, I'm going to add a payload. You got to show that the payload does something. There's a reason behind it. So I thought it was safer to follow the, uh, you know, the clinical data and the and the clinical responses we've seen in checkpoint uh, two and four. That's sort of the reason. For it. Okay. Just, you have Do you have questions? Sure. Okay, Gordon. I just have a very quick question. HHLA two in uh, in the cells culture versus in vivo showing distinct patterns of the expression. Do you think that it's due to the, uh, for example, if you culture those cancer cells with the immune cells, do you think that could potentially restore HHLA expression? Or another possibility is that the cell culture media is enriched for like high glucose, which may or may not reflect the actual culture um, you know, or actual nutrient condition in vivo. Do you think that might also contribute to the regulation of the HHLA too? It's a reasonable idea. We actually have tested glucose and succinate, um, and neither of them are the inducer. Um, we have found that some, uh, if you co-culture another cell type with the kidney cancer cell, that you can get induction. And we're now investigating whether that's a cell surface or a secreted signal. I think, uh... I think we're, that's all we have time yeah. for. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for speaking today. Um, certainly, we have so many questions about your brilliant talks. Um, hopefully, these conversations can continue during the course of these two days. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.